Greetings, Kerbinauts. This is Scribble Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number seven of Project Alexandria, and it is 1961. And 1961 was a huge year in space. And two of the men responsible for some of those huge events are sitting on the screen in front of you now. John F. Kennedy being sworn in as the new president, and Lyndon B. Johnson, who you already know from a previous episode, who used his influence to ensure the passage of the 1958 National Aeronautics and Space Act, which established the civilian space agency known as NASA. And also, even if you don't know where you know it from, you know this speech, because you know this. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. And with that, 1961 is underway, ironically with a chimpanzee named Ham instead of a man. Do you remember him from the previous episode in the segment about animals in space? It's the 31st of January 1961 and Ham is launching on a Mercury Redstone known as MR2. The test flight MR1 before this went up too steeply and therefore exceeded the G limit for a human if there had been anyone on board. MR2 was supposed to go up less steeply, but one minute in there was a pitch anomaly detected by the computer. It was going up too steeply. You can see me trying to force the nose back up to simulate that pitch anomaly. At 1 minute and 24 seconds in, the craft went through max Q, and you saw I had my own far window open to see how closely my max Q matched reality. It turns out FAR had me at well over max Q from our world, which was 27.5 kilopascals. Anyway, the pitch anomaly detected by the computer continued. The nose kept rising slowly, and so by 2 minutes and 17 seconds in, the booster engine cut off 3 seconds early when the abort sequence was initiated. One second later, there was another malfunction, and the snorkel allowed the cabin oxygen to leak out. Fortunately, Ham was in a second capsule inside that simulated a spacesuit and protected him from the cabin pressure loss. One second after the snorkel malfunction, the retro pack was jettisoned without being used, and one second after that, the abort tower was jettisoned. Fifteen seconds passed now, and after that, the capsule automatically began a turnaround maneuver to point the heat shield first with a 34 degree nose down angle. From here, it's a few minutes of just riding along to Apogee. I took my best shot at getting both the final velocity and the final Apogee correct, but I reached one before I reached the other, so I kept going a couple extra seconds longer than what happened to Ham, and that resulted in a slightly lower velocity and slightly higher Apogee than Ham had. He had been going about 23 to 2600 meters per second at Biko and rose to almost 253 kilometers by five minutes into his trip. Since I'm going a little higher, it'll be a little longer for me, but it's pretty close. Once at Apogee, a periscope was retracted and a retro turnaround maneuver was initiated. This pointed the heat shield back toward the re-entry angle. Then, as soon as the tiniest bit of gravity was detected again, a roll was started at about 10 degrees per second to help with re-entry stability. 
During the flight, Ham was being monitored by ground crews. His heart rate rose to a near dangerous level, but he was the best chimp for the job. He beat out five other potential chimps for this flight and proved his worth by pushing levers as he had been trained to do in the weeks leading up to this mission. At this point, things diverge a little again. The real capsule had two chutes, a drogue and a main, while mine still has just one main. I'm continuing to work on my parts, but we'll have more flights with this capsule to get it perfect. Eleven and a half minutes into the flight, the extra hydrogen peroxide used for the attitude control system was dumped. The capsule splashed down almost 17 minutes after takeoff. Since it had gone higher than expected, it had also gone further than expected, and it took a while for the recovery ships to sail out to Ham. And his capsule was leaking, too, but they got there in time and rescued him. Ham's flight showed that the Mercury Redstone was still not ready for human flights due to the several malfunctions it experienced. Ham himself never went to space again. He was moved to the zoo in Washington, D.C., where he stayed for 17 years. In 1981, he was moved to a zoo in North Carolina to live with other chimps. Two years later, at the age of 26, he died, and he was buried in the New Mexico Museum of Space History. The Mercury spacecraft number 5 that was used in the Mercury Redstone 2 mission here is currently on display at the California Science Center in Los Angeles. You can see Ham here as the ship's crew extracts him from his small capsule and gives him his paycheck, one apple. A guy with a mic stood by to get Ham's important thoughts on his flight. Here, let me translate that for you. I can't believe what you just did to me, but I'm glad I'm back. Now where's my apple? Now we'll jump ahead a month to the launch of the Soviet Union's Venera 1 mission. I'm building a totally new launcher for this and future missions with an extra stage and improved engines. You can see me here starting the testing process. And clearly early testing is going about as well as it usually does when I'm testing a new system. It didn't really look unstable or anything, it just looked like when I started it, it wasn't going up as fast as it should have been, and I was at full throttle. So switching over here into the VAB, we get to look and see that what had happened... Whoa! Something's wrong with the sound too, that needs to be turned down. Anyway, as I was saying, what had happened was... The engine configs for real solar system weren't set to my new Molnia launcher config. Another problem, zooming in close here to get a look at those Vernier engines, they are moving in all directions. They're only supposed to move in one direction. A few of them control the pitch and a few control the yaw. Together they can work to control the roll, but they're on these little rods that make them only able to move left and right in one direction, and that means I need to go back to the VAB and fix that. But before we do that, I want to try various things like decoupling the boosters and seeing what's going on with this overheating engine, which apparently gets to be too much for it, and it explodes. So we'll be checking on what's wrong with that as well. So now we're turning it into a staging test, and various things we'll quickly scan through here to show. Various tests will be tried on it, see if it can decouple and engines fire up and perform correctly, and then we revert and go back again. We'll eventually be launching out of the Baikonur Cosmodrome, of course, but for now we're coming out of Florida. Hold on one second here while I turn on my hack gravity, just so I can do the testing and not worry about the launch parameters itself. I can flip off the engines and then just try staging some of the things and see if it's still working after making the modifications to the CFG files that I needed to make a moment ago. Anyway, I was saying we'll come out of Baikonur later, but for now we keep going out of, the, out of the default for real solar system because it's a real pain getting it to switch over and stay switched over sometimes. Whenever I load the game, it defaults back to Florida, so it's just easier to do the testing from there, and then when it's time for the real launch, then I switch over to the proper location wherever that's going to be. I have a list of all the things that need to be modified, as well as the payload itself still needs to be built. I haven't done that, but once we get all of that handled, we'll be able to go to the real one. And here we are, waiting for the launch window to arrive.
And there's our launch vehicle, the Molnia 8K78. And there's our target, the planet Venus. And we have liftoff of the Venera 1, headed for a flyby of Venus. Technically, this was the second attempt since a previous Venera 1 failed to leave orbit about a week before. My information about the first flight is a bit sketchy because the Soviet Union tried to cover up the failure, claiming it was a test vehicle and not an interplanetary probe launch. Today we believe the final stage had a liquid oxygen pump failure that left the payload stranded in orbit, and that orbit later decayed to bring the craft back down over Siberia where only a small amount of debris was later recovered. But so far so good on this launch, we're burning 32 engines right now just like earlier R7 launches. But this Molnia launcher has slightly more powerful engines and carries a fourth stage. Here's a quick look at the spreadsheet I created to make sure I was getting the parts right. I did my best to match mass values, fuel capacity, thrust and ISP, every detail within reason. It's not a 100% match since the details for this launcher are almost as sketchy as the info for the Lost Venera 1. Also, I plan on using this launcher for several missions, so a little bit of averaging has been done in between where Venera 1 was and what some future missions will need. That way I don't have to make too many modifications to mass values along the way. You can see that we're well beyond the sound barrier now and there are some nice shockwaves coming off that fairing. So unlike previous launches where I split the VAB look and the flight itself, for this mission we'll be looking as we go along. Over 300 tons right here. We're currently operating off of the first stages which include this core stage that goes a lot longer than the side ones and the four boosters here around the outside which are now a different color scheme. The engines are a little bit stronger. You can see that I have them set up with the Molnia style thrust and ISP values and that includes all of my Vernier engines as well. Originally I had this set up where there were only four launch clamps around the outside but I realized that the launch clamps because they were centered were bumping these little fins as I lifted off. So instead I put two on each one to let the fin go up through the middle. Now of course on the real launcher these lights aren't there but as you know I like to have more lights. So if we scroll our way up here and grab one of these boosters, what will happen, as you know, is these will all come off, leaving us with this one core booster to go for a couple more minutes before we move into this gorgeous looking upper stage. There are several firsts for this mission and I'll explain those as we go along. We're closing in right now on the booster separation though. Here they go now, after burning more than 40 tons of fuel each, we'll drop off these 3.5 ton dry boosters. We've lost well more than half of our initial launch mass just getting this far into the air. But it's not about how high, it's about how fast. We need to be going more than 7,000 meters per second before we'll be into our temporary parking orbit. And that segues nicely into some of the world firsts going on right now. No one had ever done a parking orbit before. For now, we're just launching our payload into a 229 by 282 kilometer parking orbit. There will be a separate departure burn after the final stage has been aligned with the departure angle. And this leads us to the next world first. This is the first time an engine has been restarted in orbit. Also, we would not even need to do this if not for the next world first, the first interplanetary probe. We might have gone to Mars first if it had been closer, but Venus happened to be in its launch window. So here we go, headed to Venus. After dropping away these boosters right here, 
This stage will be much lower down in fuel, at least half of the fuel gone from burning while those boosters were going, which leaves us pretty low in launch mass, way down under the 300 where we started. Eventually, we will drain this out as well, and look at that. Once we've done that, we'll be down to 38 on this launcher. Finally able to drop away this lower stage, the core, after these engines get ignited, so those start up first, allowing the exhaust to come out through here, allowing this whole section to drop away, and the fairing around the engine will drop as well. By that point, we will have already lost this fairing up here, dropping that away even while that lower booster is still going. And that will leave us with this, at roughly 30 to 31 tons on my launcher here. And here goes the fairing now. We're well above 100 kilometers. In fact, we're above 120 kilometers, though I'm not sure when the real Molnia launcher dropped its fairing. I think most modern vessels drop the fairing above 100 kilometers, so I assumed the same for this one. The key is that the air needs to be less dense, almost a vacuum, and the temperature needs to be low enough that we're clear to release the fairing without risking damage to the payload. Now I'm angling the nose just above the horizon enough to try for that 282 kilometer apoapsis I mentioned earlier. I'm watching the speed of my ascent in the seconds to apoapsis, and from those I'm trying to judge the nose angle of the craft so that when the fuel runs out we'll be at the right altitude. It's easier to do this as the seconds to apogee get closer to zero, so I'm still allowing that to drop. If I angle up from the horizon, the apogee gets further away. Staying closer to the horizon makes the time to apogee drop towards zero. Here's a good look at that new third and fourth stage with our 643 kilogram payload riding on the nose of it all. Another stop in the VAB will let us take a look at the next two stages that we're going to be powering on. So there's the engine of this stage. You can see that we have the four large ones and then these four verniers around the outside. Those are the ones that can move around. See, these are fixed solidly in place behind this shield that protects it for when, from when the engine is turned on. Nothing will blow back up into here and damage anything. So to be able to maneuver, we need to have these vernier engines. This one can go back and forth this way like this one and then these rotate back and forth this way. That gives us complete pitch and yaw and roll if we angle them all in one direction around the outside. Moving our way up here past more lights. We have a little fairing right here that's connected to this very special truss segment that is one of the unique things about this mission. So once this part has dropped away right here, we're left with this fourth stage and the payload. And this section right down in here that can come off after it has been used has some solid boosters right there and right there. And those boosters, when they're activated, give the whole upper stage here the thrust it needs to force the fuel down into the engine, supply those pumps, and allow this to turn on. Once this engine is on and these little solid boosters have been drained, which doesn't take long, then this can drop away. At that point, we are left with this engine that has full pitch and yaw control. And these little ones right here and over here give it the roll control that it needs. Now by the time we get down to this, we are down at 5 tons on this launcher that I've set up. This part down here will be used to orient the whole craft in the direction it needs to go, then these will turn on, then the engine on, then this drops away, then this burns for a couple minutes pushing us over toward Venus, and finally once that's done, this can drop away along with its little decoupler, leaving behind our 643 kilogram payload, Venera 1. While we're here, let's take a little look at it because right in front of us is another one of the world firsts. This would have been the first time that a parabolic antenna was used to communicate back to Earth from its deep space mission. We'll come back to this in a bit, but there are some other sensors around here as well as solar panels and a little engine up on top that would theoretically have been used in order to do some deep space maneuvers, which was another first if this had been successful. As it is, this mission is only going to be partially successful, but we'll get to that in a moment. Here we are, back in orbit, almost at my 282 kilometer apogee. 
So now I am angling the nose down to prevent the apogee going any higher while my perigee comes up to the desired altitude. Then we'll shut down and see how we did. I'm not sure how much longer the Soviet Union might have had on its launch window to Venus. The original plan was to go to Mars first, but like I said earlier, that window came and went. Meanwhile, the probe plans were scaled back again and again. Korolev had wanted to reach Mars in 1960, but missed the launch window, so the probe is now going to Venus instead. Oh, here we go. I'm just over 282 kilometers apogee and a little under the 229 perigee that I'd wanted, but it's pretty close. All right, here we are in orbit. Right over there, I can see EVE, which is the double for Venus using real solar system. We have our orbit right around here. Wow, look at all those other things from previous episodes that we still have going. Anyway, here we are. We have our Venera one going around like this and somewhere roughly around in here, we're going to want to start doing a burn, an exit burn that's going to send us out of the Earth's sphere of influence. So we'll just do this for now pull ourselves back out here and see how we're doing. Obviously, we want to get these two lines synced up. So let me grab this and drag it around more in that direction. And then we'll scroll out here and take a look and see how we're doing. We can see our descending node right over there and our orbit going around. I will boost a little bit further until we can get it down to the orbit of Venus. There we go, pretty close right there. Let's take a look in here, make sure these are still lining up correctly. Then we'll back ourselves out here one more time, double check that location. Really close right there, just a little tweaking on the two sides here. Should be able to get us a, a nice intercept. And there it is, we've got something. Now I wanna find out what we have. So we'll go in closer here to Eve and take a look, see where the periapsis is. Still pretty far out. The real Venera went in at 100,000 kilometers. We're currently at 400, well 388, but you know closer to the 400 than 100. So I'll just mess around with this a little bit longer and see what we can get. Well, apparently I've got it down to 40, less than 40,000 kilometers. So that's gonna be well within the range of what the real one did as it went by. I'm going to leave it at that for now. And in 18 minutes, we'll be making our burn for about 3,500 meters per second, sending us on the way to Venus. Anyway, Kurilov's plan was for the Mars flyby and then a Venus landing. But now we're behind schedule and the landing has been scaled back to just a Venus flyby. Meanwhile, probe complexity has been scaled back as well, making the payload lighter and lighter in order to make this trip even possible. There goes the Eulage booster stage, a world first. And now the main engine can be started while the booster truss is dropped away. I modified these engines to have what I feel is a prettier flame relative to my early tests with the default engines. We'll spin stabilize and this engine will burn for more than two minutes and then release the payload for its long journey. The plan was for regular status updates from the probe using its world first copper mesh high gain parabolic antenna. But with so many new technologies in one craft, something was bound to go wrong. And in this case, a few things. A highly sensitive temperature control system was supposed to open motorized louvers around the body, keeping the internal temperature at about 30 degrees Celsius. But it malfunctioned, overheated, and the solar orientation system was damaged and failed. The craft had two modes, a spin stabilized mode and a second static mode where it could keep its solar panels pointed within 10 degrees perpendicular to the sun at all times using gyroscopes. After it overheated and could not be kept pointed at the sun properly, it was commanded to enter spin stabilized mode. With the lower power available, only two sessions of telemetry were successfully carried out on the 12th as it was leaving Earth from 30,000 kilometers and again from 170,000 kilometers. We're opening the solar panels now, so let's take a look at the probe in the VAB. 
So here are the solar panels right here. I composed those just out of a couple panels, even though they're not quite the right shape. There should be a bit of a taper right here. And then I put on some regular solar panels scaled to different sizes to just give it that little bit of a patchy look. Did the same thing for the other side over here and then put them on using these hinges, Infernal Robotics hinges right there and right there. There's more instruments here, like this one may be an infrared spectrometer. I'm representing a couple more here that I'm not even quite sure what they were. And if we scroll around to the back here, we can see we have some ion traps right there. And if we open this up, this is a magnetometer, just like that. That one extends out. Continuing to scroll around over on this side, we have our sun locator right there, but that of course is the one that overheated and failed. Then there's our parabolic antenna, our fuel reserves are probably up here since that's the little engine that allows it to do its deep space maneuvers. Also there would be tiny little jets on the outside for alignment purposes as well as a gyroscope inside that once the major maneuver to get it aligned properly was done the gyroscope could keep it using the fine tuning just from electrical power the solar panels would power that. Telemetry was stopped on purpose to conserve power and then a third session sent back data on the 17th from 1.9 million kilometers. After that, radio contact was lost. The next planned telemetry session was silent. At the moment, we're still close to the Earth though. You can see that I've opened up my solar panels and the parabolic antenna and now it's time to stick out that magnetometer. Those solar panels, that dish, and the magnetometer are the only things that I have on this that I can interact with and activate with action groups. So here we are as it is spinning away, heading off into deeper space away from Earth. And then we'll show how we would have oriented it toward the sun when we didn't have it in its spin stabilized mode. Although of course that's going to change once that overheats. We'll have to switch back to spin stabilized for the whole rest of the trip. But for now, safely in orbit and heading into deeper space before the malfunctions, we can watch as the Earth fades away behind us. Or perhaps I should say in front of us, since we've slowed down, which means the Earth is now getting away ahead of us. We reach our first telemetry point that I had already talked about earlier, and then we send back whatever data we've collected so far. The further out we go, the more we learn about the conditions in deep space. A wind had already been detected from Luna 2, which by the way you may see nearby in its heliocentric orbit as Venera 1 heads deeper into space itself. Well that solar wind was detected again by Venera 1, providing the first verification that the plasma was uniformly distributed throughout deep space. We're at our second telemetry point right now, and then I fast forward again so that we can zip ahead to the SOI, going out into our heliocentric orbit and heading for Venus, currently on an intercept that will bring it within 100,000 kilometers of the planet's surface. Unfortunately, by now we are well out of contact with it, so no data ever gets sent back detailing what it got to see as it passed by. But you'll get to see, I'm going to take us right by the surface, showing what it might have been like, what sort of data we might have been able to get back had we had communications with it. Since I showed you the planet's surface a little earlier in this episode, I've managed to add clouds now. So now the planet looks a lot like what it would have been if this were the real Venus. Second planet from the sun with a mass about 80% that of Earth. Here you can see it now, the morning star to some, the evening star to others. Shrouded in acidic clouds almost a hundred times more dense than Earth's atmosphere. High speed winds, temperatures well above boiling. Not a hospitable planet. And with that, Venus is gone. Venera 1 heads into a heliocentric orbit where it continues to drift today. It's the 12th of April 1961 and the Soviet Union is about to etch the name of one of their own into every history book across the globe. Yuri Gagarin. Rolling up to the launch complex in a bus, Gagarin is in Kazakhstan. He's climbing aboard the Vostok 1. The spacecraft is a Vostok 3KA number 3. 
sitting on launch pad number one in Baikonur. It's the same launch site where Sputnik was launched, ushering in this space race. He's buckled into his almost five-ton craft, sitting atop over 300 kilotons of launch vehicle. He has nothing to do now but sit back and enjoy the ride. Yuri recorded a message before boarding the craft. Dear friends, known and unknown to me, my dear compatriots and all the people of the world, in the next few minutes, a mighty spaceship will carry me off into the distant spaces of the universe. What can I say to you in these last minutes before the start? All my life now appears as a single beautiful moment to me. All I have done and lived for has been done and lived for for this moment. The ground base was ready and radioed to Gagarin. Preliminary stage, intermediate, main, liftoff, we wish you a good flight. Everything is all right. To which he said only this. The Vostok was designed to carry one cosmonaut, so a pool of candidates was of course needed. Nikolai Kamanin was the head of the cosmonaut training program and had 20 candidates left to choose from. It was narrowed down to two over several months, Gagarin and German Titov. Kamanin was having a hard time deciding who'd fly, and he wrote in his diary, the only thing that keeps me from picking is the need to have the stronger person for the one-day flight. He was referring to the second flight that was supposed to be several orbits and last a whole day. Gagarin's flight was nearly suborbital. Technically, it was an orbital flight, but would actually retro-burn and deorbit before making it around one whole time. So Kamanin had to decide who would go first and get all the glory versus who was actually the better candidate to go second for the harder flight. At the age of 27, it was Yuri who was chosen while Titov became the first backup and Grigory Nilyabov was the second backup. All three were part of an elite class of cosmonauts that will later pick up the nickname the Sochi Six. The decision to send Gagarin was made four days before the flight, but it was kept such a secret that no one knew who didn't need to know, not even the other cosmonauts. First backup Titov indeed went to space second, and we'll see that next episode. Second to backup Nulyabov was presumably the first backup to the second flight, and therefore probably thought he'd go to space third. But then he was chosen as only a backup again and again for the next missions, and never officially became one of the six who went to space. My guess is this wore on him emotionally and he started drinking. He was eventually discharged from service after a drunken disorderly charge. He continued drinking and a few years later stepped in front of a train. His image was airbrushed out of the official Sochi 6 photos, which then led to various conspiracy theories about missing cosmonauts. Getting back to Gagarin, Yuri put on a brave face, but I think he had a suspicion he was not going to survive. The last few unmanned flights had been a complete success, but this was something new entirely. His doctors wrote about it in the pre-flight exam. Gagarin looked more pale than usual. He was unsociable and quiet, which was not like him at all. He would answer by nodding or a short yes to all questions. Sometimes he would start humming some tunes. This was a different Gagarin. We geared him up and hugged, and I said, Yuri, everything will be fine, and he nodded back. Well, that sounds to me like a guy who's about to be led down the green mile. So far, so good, though. We've made it to space and the fairing has separated. The bits of it are now dropping far behind our core booster stage. That stage is almost out of fuel, and as with previous flights just like this one, stage three will be ignited while we're still going on the first core, making sure that the fuel is being forced into the pumps, and then when the bottom stage dries up, it drops away. We have a few more minutes on the third stage here as we get into orbit before we decouple that one, and Yuri will be flying free, but until then, he can already see through the little window. Once the fairing was away, Yuri said, Through the window I can see the earth. The ground is clearly discernible. And Kordelev, back on the ground, reported back, Cedar, this is Dawn 1. All is okay. The spacecraft is flying well. Over. And Yuri called back down, Understood. 
I see rivers and folds in the terrain. They are easily distinguishable. The visibility is good. Everything is so clear through the window, over. In our view in KSP here, you can see now that the orbit is becoming much more discernible itself. It is passing over the majority of the Soviet Union, going across a little peninsula on the far east, then wrapping around again, coming up underneath Africa after passing under South America. During his descent, it is said that Yuri was whistling the song you can hear in the background as he was coming down. This announcement was made on Soviet radio after his historic flight. Говорит Москва. Говорит Москва. Работают все радиостанции Советского Союза. Московское время 10 часов 2 минуты. Передаем сообщение ТАСС о первом в мире полете человека в космическое пространство. 12 апреля 1961 года в Советском Союзе выведен на орбиту вокруг Земли первый в мире космический корабль-спутник «Восток» с человеком на борту. Пилотом космонавтом космического корабля спутника Восток является гражданин Союза Советских Социалистических Республик, летчик майор Гагарин Юрий Алексеевич. Старт космической многоступенчатой ракеты прошел успешно и после набора первой космической скорости и отделения от последней ступени ракеты-носителя, корабль-спутник начал свободный полет по орбите вокруг Земли. During re-entry, the service module did not decouple from the main capsule properly. It was a very shaky return until the cable holding the parts together finally gave way and the capsule was allowed to re-enter freely. The trajectory was a little off, and he experienced 8 to 10 Gs as he came down. Like all these early flights, the pilot ejected from the capsule before reaching the ground. That was kept a secret for a long time. Since space flights were not supposed to be officially recognized by world organizations unless the pilot returned with the spacecraft. In any case, Gagarin was declared Hero of the Soviet Union, received a medal, and proceeded to go all around the world on press tours. He was never allowed into space again after becoming such a valuable Soviet prize. He died in a 1968 plane crash. Reports are sketchy, and there are conspiracy theories, of course, like how he was assassinated to cover up the fact that he did not actually go into space first, that really it was just his voice being transmitted back to the ground. But if you ask me, what little evidence I have on hand suggests that what happened is another pilot heard that Gagarin was flying nearby in his training exercise, and the other pilot flew by Gagarin's plane too closely, while either goofing off or showing off or something, flipped it out of control, and it eventually crashed. Well, now we are partway through 1961, but if you look at this list of everything that happened in 61, you can see that it was ton and we've barely scratched the surface. I, of course, won't be covering all of these. I've already skipped many of these and I'll skip many more. But there are a few other major events in 61, more than I can cover in what's left of this episode that is already getting to the ending point. So we'll pause here and we'll come back to this. We'll split it up into two parts. And when we get back, we will continue with the Alan Shepard first American in space launch. Until next time, I will see you later, Kerbinauts.